Good morning, church family. Lord willing, we are one week away from gathering together for worship as we are planning to have an outdoor in-person worship gathering next Sunday, June 28th at 9 a.m., which will take place in the back field adjacent to the Family Ministry Center. We also want to let everyone know that we will be continuing our online digital worship service on YouTube Premiere, as well as on our website, nmbchurch.org and our NMBC Church app at 11 a.m. every Sunday morning, that this will remain in place for those who are particularly at risk or are uncomfortable attending in-person worship services just yet, as well as being in place for those Sundays when the weather doesn't allow for an outdoor worship service. So we are grateful that this time of being apart is coming to an end, and we cannot wait to be together next Sunday morning as we enter into this new season as a church family. But with all that being said, we're continuing our sermon series this morning in Jesus' famous Sermon on the Mount, which we've been looking at together these past couple of weeks and can be found in the Gospel of Matthew in chapters 5 through 7. And our text this morning is in Matthew chapter 5, verses 21 through 26. But before we go there, I'd like to give a quick recap of what we've covered together thus far to get us all on the same page and up to speed. So the Sermon on the Mount serves as God's vision for his kingdom and his kingdom people, the church. And it opens with a series of nine blessings Jesus gives that are known as the Beatitudes. And so we looked at the Beatitudes last week and we saw how these nine blessings that Jesus gives function as a composite sketch for what a disciple or follower of Jesus Christ looks like in the kingdom of God or kingdom of heaven. The, those two terms, kingdom of God and kingdom of heaven, are used interchangeably in Matthew's gospel. And so the word bless that is repeated over and over again by Jesus in the Beatitudes is the Greek word makarios, meaning flourishing. And so Jesus uses this word and subsequent blessings to communicate how we as human beings were designed to live by God, reconciled to one another at peace with a selfless servant-like spirit. And Jesus models for us what human flourishing looks like through his example as the selfless suffering servant Messiah who was willing to sacrifice himself on our behalf so that we could know and receive the love of God. And so this is the way Jesus calls us to live our lives and love others as his followers, as citizens of his kingdom. And so our text this morning in Matthew chapter 5, verses 21 through 26, follows the passage we opened our series with three weeks ago, Matthew chapter 5, verses 17 through 20, as we've been jumping around a little bit out of, out of sequence in order to show how at the center of the Sermon on the Mount is how Jesus points to himself as the fulfillment of the Old Testament law and prophets in establishing his kingdom. And so this morning, we begin a new section in the Sermon on the Mount, beginning here in Matthew chapter 5, verse 21, where Jesus gives the first of six examples contrasting his interpretation of the law of God over and against the corrupt religious leaders of his day, the scribes and the Pharisees. And so Jesus says in Matthew chapter 5, verses 17 through 20, Do not think that I have come to abolish the law or the prophets. I have not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. For truly, I say to you, until heaven and earth pass away, not an iota, not a dot will pass from the law until all is accomplished. Therefore, whoever relaxes one of the least of these commandments and teaches others to do the same will be called least in the kingdom of heaven. But whoever does them and teaches them will be called great in the kingdom of heaven. For I tell you, unless your righteousness exceeds that of the scribes and Pharisees, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. And so what Jesus is saying here is that he has not come to undermine the authority or set aside the Old Testament scriptures, particularly the law of Moses, but rather as the creator and author of the law, Jesus has come to fulfill them down to the most minute detail in order to bring about the reality of human flourishing and blessing that they point to. The contrast that is being made here is not between the law given through Moses and the teachings of Jesus, but rather the false interpretation of God's law by the scribes and the Pharisees 
and the true interpretation of the law given by the Lord Jesus himself. And so we must be careful not to fall into the same trap as the rich young ruler we read about in Matthew chapter 19, who thought he had kept the law and obtained salvation because in following the teachings of the scribes and the Pharisees, he had lived a moral lifestyle of external obedience. He's the kind of guy that you look at and say, oh, he's, he's a good guy. He's a good person. However, what we tragically find out is that such false teaching abandons the very spirit and meaning of the law, which is meant to lead us to fellowship with God. And the rich young ruler walks away from his encounter with Jesus with great sorrow because it's uncovered that he loves his wealth more than God, thereby making him guilty of disobeying the first commandment, you shall have no other gods before me. That despite his external righteousness, his heart was far from God. And so this is why Jesus says in Matthew chapter 5, verse 20, For I tell you, unless your righteousness exceeds that of the scribes and Pharisees, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. What Jesus is saying here is that outward obedience to all the rules and regulations set up by the scribes and the Pharisees won't lead us to salvation. That we must imitate the example of the Apostle Paul, who, like the rich young ruler, also achieved many accolades in the eyes of the scribes and Pharisees to the point where he shares a list of them in Philippians chapter 3, referring to himself according to the law as a Hebrew of Hebrews. However, then Paul shares how by the grace of God, his eyes were opened to the truth of God, that external obedience to the law did not have the power to save him from his sin, but it is only through a transformed heart that comes by grace through faith in Jesus Christ alone. That Paul testifies to this in Philippians chapter 3, verses 9 through 11. He says, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which comes through faith in Christ, the righteousness from God that depends on faith, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and may share his sufferings, becoming like him in his death, that by any means possible, I may attain the resurrection from the dead. The inward transformation in Paul's life that came from the power of the gospel translated to an outward righteousness in how he lived his life with genuine authenticity in how he loved God and others. The Apostle Paul goes on to say in Romans 7 how the purpose of the law is to make us aware of our sin, to peel back the layers of rebellion and disobedience against God within our hearts and point us to our desperate need of the grace and transforming power that only can come from God. The good news of the gospel is that Jesus has provided us with this greater righteousness in himself. And that when we trust in him for salvation and follow him in discipleship, that inner righteousness takes root in our heart and results in our flourishing into the people God has called us to be. And so the first of these six examples of greater righteousness that Jesus calls us to in the Sermon on the Mount is in contrasting his true interpretation of the law of God against the false interpretation of scribes and Pharisees begins with what you would think is the most obvious, the most obvious and easy to understand and to follow in all of the law. It's the sixth commandment that we read in Exodus chapter 20, verse 13. You shall not murder. Sounds pretty cut and dry and pretty simple, right? Well, not exactly. So we're going to see how it's possible for the scribes and the Pharisees to kind of mess this up and, and where they go wrong and how Jesus tells us the true meaning uh, of, of the law and what, what God is trying to get at in, in cutting to the heart of what it means not to murder. And so we're going to go ahead and find out now by reading our passage this morning, Matthew chapter 5, verses 21 through 26. Jesus says here, You have heard that it was said to those of old, You shall not murder, and whoever murders will be liable to judgment. But I say to you that everyone who is angry with his brother will be liable to judgment. Whoever insults his brother will be liable to the council, and whoever says, You fool, will be liable to the hell of fire. So if you are offering your gift at the altar, and there remember that your brother has something against you, leave your gift there before the altar and go. First be reconciled to your brother, and then come and offer your gift. Come to terms quickly with your accuser while you are going with him to court, lest your accuser hand you over to the judge and the judge to the guard and you be put in prison. Truly I say to you, you will never get out until you have paid the last penny. So this passage is broken up nicely into three parts. 
Uh, first, verses 21 and 22 defines the law for a citizen of the kingdom of heaven. Then second, in verses 23 and 24, uh, Jesus provides for us the first of two mini parables that emphasize the vital importance of reconciliation in the kingdom of heaven. And then lastly, in verses 25 and 26, Jesus provides us with the second of his two mini parables, explaining the urgency of resolving conflict and confessing our anger quickly as possible. So the passage begins with Jesus contrasting the scribes and Pharisees' interpretation of the law with his own in verses 21 and 22, where we read, Jesus says, You have heard that it was said to those of old, You shall not murder, and whoever murders will be liable to judgment. But I say to you that everyone who is angry with his brother will be liable to judgment. Whoever insults his brother will be liable to the council, and whoever says, You fool, will be liable to the hell of fire. Verse 21 begins with the phrase, you have heard that it was said, which is referring to the teachings of the scribes and the Pharisees. Then it's followed by the sixth commandment from the Decalogue, you shall not murder. And then the verse closes with the scribes and Pharisees teaching for what the consequence is for breaking that commandment, which they say is being liable to judgment. Now the key to understanding verse 21 is the final word translated here as judgment, which is the Greek word krisis which is specifically referring to judgment in a court of law. And so essentially what the scribes and Pharisees were teaching was that the main motivation for not committing murder was that you could get caught and go to jail. And so it's this kind of faulty teaching that leads Jesus to say of the scribes and Pharisees in Matthew chapter 23, verses 27 and 28, Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites! For you are like whitewashed tombs, which outwardly appear beautiful, but within are full of dead people's bones and all uncleanness. So you also outwardly appear righteous to others, but within you are full of hypocrisy and lawlessness. The scribes and Pharisees' teaching exposes their inner decay that as the religious leaders of the people of Israel, their teaching is so off base that when talking about committing murder, there's no mention of the inward sinful heart attitudes that would lead someone to committing murder. Their, interpreta their interpretation speaks nothing of the kingdom of heaven. They express no concern for people's souls. And what is even more outrageous is that there's zero mention of God anywhere. And so what Jesus sets out to do is expose the scribes and Pharisees' faulty teaching that only appeals to people's selfish motivations and the outward consequences pertaining to murder. So in, in response, Jesus gives his interpretation, clarifying the law for his followers, those who are citizens of his kingdom, the kingdom of heaven. And so Jesus says in verse 22, But I say to you that everyone who is angry with his brother will be liable to judgment. Whoever insults his brother will be liable to the council, and whoever says, you fool, will be liable to the hell of fire. And so what Jesus does here is he completely turns the scribes and Pharisees' teaching on its head. He says, forget about having to stand trial for murdering someone. You should have to stand trial for just being angry at someone. In fact, you should have to stand trial before the very Sanhedrin for the kind of anger that leads you to lash out at someone. And if your anger is bad enough that it's brought you to the place where you're willing to vilify a person with such bitterness and hatred to condemn them as a fool, then you're liable to the fire of hell. And so what Jesus is getting at here is this kind of heart attitude and behavior does not belong to those who are his followers and are citizens in the kingdom of heaven. The Lord Jesus is uncovering the true interpretation of the law that what matters most to God is not merely the letter of the law, but it's the spirit of the law. That, that God cares about the heart, that God considers murder to be the hatred, bitterness, and resentment that causes us to tear one another down whether it be with our words of criticism and condemnation, destroying someone's reputation, our acts of selfishness and, and revenge. What Jesus is trying to get at is the, is the inward attitude that is at the heart of the outward manifestation of such anger and hatred that can ultimately lead to the kind of evil that motivates someone to take another person's life. And so it leads us to ask the question, where does this kind of anger come from? When Jesus says in verse 22, whoever insults his brother will be liable to the council, the word that is used there for insult is the Greek word raka, which is more specific than just a vague insult. It means fool, good for nothing, or a worthless person. And it is heartbreaking to see that it is this kind of evil heart attitude 
which is at the center of the chaos we see going on in our world today. That people are taking to the streets and to their keyboards on social media to express their anger and being made to feel like they are less than. That, that they feel as though they're just a statistic to be, to be made to feel less than human. And you know, every now and then, I'll come across a, a book or a film that'll stay with me for a while. That sheds light on an issue that gives you new perspective and it causes you to, to think. And for me, I, I watched a film over quarantine and, and it really stayed with me, and it was the, the movie Joker. And this by no means is an endorsement to watch it, as it turns out to be a, a pretty rough uh, and dark movie. And I, I watched it thinking that I was getting a comic book movie, but instead it ended up being this dark, uh, introspective com commentary about the, the marginalized in our society, the, the mentally ill. Uh, that are mistreated and those that have suffered abuse. That the point of the movie was what horrible circumstances could cause someone such pain to turn into such a monster like the Joker. And, and you know, that thought has stayed with me. And as I watched the violence and lawlessness taking place during the riots that have transpired over the last month, initially it caused me to get angry, even furious. And I know there's such a thing as righteous anger. And when we see people's homes and businesses being destroyed as well as being victimized by violence, that should upset us all. It, it, it grieves God. But when Jesus exudes righteous anger, he almost never does so at the loss, but rather at, at the religious leaders who should know better. Jesus was also a master at being able to hate the sin and love the sinner. And so the, the, by the grace of God, my initial anger began to subside and I found myself questioning what horrible circumstances could cause someone such pain to act out this way. And then I came across a quote that Pastor Tom shared in his series on racial reconciliation from his leadership blog uh, from this past week, which was incredibly powerful, articulate, and well-written if you haven't read it yet. And it was a quote from Martin Luther King given from a speech he gave at Stanford in 1967. And he said, certain conditions continue to exist in our society, which must be condemned as vigorously as we condemn riots. But in the final analysis, a riot is the language of the unheard. And what is it that America has failed to hear? It has failed to hear that the plight of the Negro poor has worsened over the last few years. It has failed to hear that the promise of freedom and justice have not been met. And it has failed to hear that large segments of white society are more concerned about tranquility and the status quo than about justice, equality, and humanity. Then in all of the places, I came across a meme that had been circling around the internet that stopped me dead in my tracks and cut me to the heart. It said, you keep saying it's horrible that an innocent black man was killed, but destroying property has to stop. Try saying it's horrible that property is being destroyed, but killing innocent black men has to stop. Of course, I'm in no way giving approval or justifying the violence, looting, and lawlessness that we've seen taking place uh, around our country in the last couple of weeks. And it's a shame that we're living in such times that I even have to provide such a disclaimer. But the point is that before we allow hate and anger to grow in our hearts at what's happening around us, we must ask ourselves, how is Jesus calling me to respond? In the Beatitudes, Jesus says that as his disciple and as a citizen of the kingdom of heaven, I am to mourn for injustice, that I am to be meek and listen. I am to hunger and thirst for righteousness, that is equality. I am to be merciful to those who are crying out in pain, that I am to, to refrain from being critical condemning and making accusations against others. Jesus tells me, blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the people of God. The Lord is calling us to humble ourselves, to be good news people in the midst of all of this bad news and anger, that we are called to be the peacemakers, that we are called to love others and, and de-escalate things, that, that we're not to fight fire with fire, fight ang return anger with anger, 
right? That as the people of God, we are called to be the peacemakers, that we all need to humble ourselves and be slow to speak and eager to listen and be able to will, be willing to, to walk in someone else's shoes. Because the truth is, I've never been called a racial slur. I don't know what it's like to be judged by the color of my skin or feel like I live in a world where I'm assumed guilty until proven innocent. But what we must collectively recognize is that the answer to the inequality and justice and violence in our midst is not more violence, riots, and thirst for revenge. That this only escalates matters. That we must look to the author of justice and the prince of peace, Jesus Christ, that as his followers, we would be willing to take up our cross and follow him, being willing to endure injustice and persecution as Jesus did at Calvary, that after being crucified, he declared, it is finished, that this all stops here with me. And then after clearly, in every way, being the victim, being victimized, he did not seek revenge on his perpetrators. But instead, he cried out to his heavenly father, Father, forgive them, that this is the way of reconciliation, that this is the way of peace. It is the way of the cross. It is the way of Jesus. And so before we move forward, let me just say this. I am so thankful and proud to worship alongside some of our police officers that model the humility and love of Christ as they serve and protect us and our community. And this needs to be said because they are being asked to do an impossible job right now. That these men and women need our prayers as they are being asked to simultaneously face violence and be peacemakers. And so whether it be Mike, Mike Reuter, Rich Johnson, Josh Black, and many other police officers who worship with us from time to time, thank you for your service and you are in our prayers. And so as we move forward, looking at the remainder of our passage, Jesus gives us two mini parables to illustrate the vital importance of reconciliation in his kingdom and how we are to pursue reconciliation as his followers. In verses 23 and 24, Jesus gives the first of these two mini parables that emphasizes the priority and importance of reconciliation in God's kingdom. We read in verses 23 and 24, Jesus says, So if you are offering your gift at the altar... And there, remember that your brother has something against you. Leave your gift there before the altar and go. First be reconciled to your brother, and then come and offer your gift. Jesus uses an illustration here of a worshiper who has most likely traveled from Galilee 80 miles to present his offering, most likely a sacrificed animal, at the temple in Jerusalem. Jesus is saying that reconciliation is so central to our being as citizens of the kingdom of heaven that if it means dropping everything and making the round trip week's journey from Jerusalem to Galilee and back again in order to make things right with their offended brother or sister before presenting their off offering and worship to the Lord, then it's more than worth it. And so this exaggerated hypothetical scenario makes the point that right relationships demand action. Not being angry or harboring bitter thoughts against one another is not enough. We must take action to make sure we are right with one another. And so this goes doubly important for the church whose entire mission is predicated on how we love one another. It's why we read in Mark chapter 11, verse 25, And whenever you stand praying, forgive. If you have anything against anyone, so that your Father also who is in heaven may forgive you your trespasses. It is why we make ourselves right with God and one another, as Paul instructs us not to partake in the Lord's Supper in an unworthy manner in 1 Corinthians chapter 11 before going to the communion table. And so again, we must take action, functioning as agents of reconciliation if we are to answer the call on our lives as disciples of Jesus Christ. Lastly, in verses 25 and 26, Jesus gives his second of these two mini parables in this passage this time focusing on the urgent nature of reconciliation. And so we read in verses 25 and 26, Jesus says, come, come to terms quickly with your accuser while you are going with him to court, lest your accuser hand you over to the judge and the judge to the guard, and you be put in prison. Truly I say to you, you will never get out until you have paid the last penny. 
And so in this parable, Jesus gives the illustration how it always benefits us when we're able to resolve a legal matter quickly out of court because the longer things transpire, usually the worse and more expensive the matter gets with the possibility of things getting out of control. And so Paul tells us in Ephesians chapter 4, verse 26, do not let the sun go down on your anger. The anger is like a fire that needs to be snuffed out before it has air to breathe and feed on. That there is no room for grudges, bitterness, or sweeping things under the rug in the kingdom of heaven. Dr. Martin Lloyd-Jones, the well-known pastor of Westminster Chapel in London, writes, If I, in the presence of God, and while trying to worship God, actively know there is sin in my heart which I have not dealt with and confessed, my worship is useless. There is no value in it at all. If you are in a state of conscious hostility against another, if you are not speaking to another person, or if you are harboring unkind thoughts that are a hindrance and an obstacle to one another, God's word assures you that there is no value in your attempted act of worship. We see time and again that it is our anger that separates us from God and from one another. That it's the anger that exists today in our country that has left us so divided. That more than ever, the Lord is calling us as his disciples and citizens of his kingdom to be the peacemakers in our world. So that we may see reconciliation take place in our midst. We read in 2 Corinthians chapter 5 verses 18 through 21. All this is from God who through Christ reconciled us to himself and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. That is, in Christ, God was reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against them, and entrusting to us the message of reconciliation. Therefore, we are ambassadors for Christ, God making his appeal through us. We implore you on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. For our sake he made him to be sin, who knew no sin, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. This is the good news of the gospel, that through the cross, Jesus has offered us reconciliation with God, where we have the opportunity to be his ambassadors of reconciliation to a world that is in such desperate need of healing. And so, how do we react to things when they don't go our way? Do we have a habit of raging out when we feel we've been wronged? Do we find that things such as certain people in our lives or watching the news instantly lights our fuse? Are, are, are we constantly finding ourselves fighting fire with fire, you know, re receiving anger and then returning it with anger? Are we constantly finding ourselves in contentious conversations and when our point of view isn't received or looked at favorably, we have a tendency to lash out? You see, it was Jesus who loved us while we were still sinners. It was he who, while being innocent, paid the price for our sin and offered us forgiveness even though he did nothing wrong. It was Jesus who laid down his rights and through the cross enables to have reconciliation with God. Now as his ambassadors, he's calling us to follow him and do the same, that we would be absent of pride, model his humility in being willing to lay down our rights and being the peacemakers in our world. For blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called the people of God. May God bless you, and Lord willing, I hope to see you next week.